Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mike Zeleny with the university, and it's my honor to welcome you to a new season of the Ian Thompson Forum on World Issues. For nearly three decades, the university and the Cooper Foundation have partnered with the Lead Center for Performing Arts to make this forum possible. Tonight, our speaker is an internationally renowned author, professor, and expert on global politics and economics. Dr. Mark Blythe currently serves as Eastman Professor of Political, Political Economy at Brown University. His research focuses on the causes of stability and change in the economy, and why people continue to believe certain economic ideas despite evidence to the contrary. Professor Blythe earned a PhD in political science from Columbia University, and the common theme of his research has been how macroeconomic knowledge is used in politics. Dr. Blythe's internationally acclaimed books have been translated into 14 languages. They include The Future of the Euro, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, and Great Transformations, Economic Ideas and Institutional Change in the 20th Century. Dr. Blythe is a regular contributor to the Journal on the, of the Council on Foreign Relations, Foreign Affairs, and the Guardian newspapers. He's appeared multiple times on NPR, BBC, and Bloomberg. Tonight, after his remarks, you will have the opportunity to ask Mark questions via Twitter using the hashtag EnThompsonForum. Also, ushers will be in the aisles to collect your written questions and bring them to the stage. The title of tonight's presentation is Why People Vote for Those Who Work Against Their Best Interests. Please join me in a warm Thompson Forum welcome for Mark Blythe. Thank you. Wow. Can you hear me? Are we on? Can you hear me? Yes. You hear me? Yes. All right, good. Because I can't see you. I can't see a damn thing. Whoa, there's a lot of people here. Is Netflix broken? I mean, really? I mean, what is it? A Tuesday? You know, someone... Wow. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's brilliant. All right. I can't see you, which is very disconcerting, but I suppose it's good in some ways. Um, let's get started. First of all, I'm Scottish. So... <laughs> You might have a problem with the way I sound. Uh, for those of you who are going, why does that guy sound funny? Let me explain this. Have you ever seen the film Shrek? Yeah. Right. So after 27 years in the United States, I have exactly the same voice as Shrek. I will prove this to you now. Donkey. So if you at any point you're sort of fiddling out going, what's that guy talking about? Just think Shrek and it'll all come back in, right? Um, second thing is I actually have a bit of a cough, so if I basically go down and cough up a lung halfway through, it's normal, I'll be fine. Uh, and then the third one is the title. Um, I didn't actually make this title up, the Thompson Forum did. So when I was putting the slides together, I went to the website and said, oh, I didn't give them a title. I wonder what, and, and I saw this and I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> see, because I actually, to get things started, I actually don't believe that's true. So let me explain what I mean by that. I think it's incredibly patronizing for anyone to tell someone else what they think should be in their interest. So it's very easy, particularly for sort of, you know, elites, however that word is used or abused, to say, well, it's in the best interest of people to do this, or people vote against their interest. I was like, really? Maybe they just see the world in a very different way from you. Maybe you don't like the way that they see the world, but they're entitled to see the world that way, and they will act upon it. And the more that you tell them they shouldn't do this, they're probably going to tell you, no, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to use the title as a provocation to then feed into this and see where we go with it. So you ready to play? Yeah. All right, let's go. Let's see if I can figure out this. Let's look at like, like one of the, like, remember Star Trek? It's like, <laughs> I think this thing will come on. Yay, there we go. All right. Here's, here's the thing. So I, I, you may or may not know, I got Trump six months out and I got Brexit three months before that because I pay attention to what's called macroeconomic regimes. Boring title. I'll be there in a minute. Here's the thing. President Trump is a local event and it's part of a global trend. Brexit's the same thing. The German elections that just happened have reconfirmed the trend despite the fact that the French National Front didn't get elected. This has been 30 years in the making. It's popular. Everybody has a version of this, whether it's the guy in the Philippines that like killing people who are on drugs, whether it's the Japanese prime minister who likes provoking things with Japan, whether it's Trump telling us that NAFTA's dead and tweeting various things, whether it's Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland saying she wants independence, she doesn't want independence, she does want independence, right? The Catalans in Spain could be up there, right? This is kicking off everywhere. 
In fact, here's a little picture of some of the most notable ones, left and right. Oddly, the left-wing ones are on the right, the right-wing ones are on the left, but bear with me. But as you can see, and this is very important, there's a huge left-wing phenomenon here. Jeremy Corbyn, Nicola, we've got De Linke, you have the Italian version up there, Spain, and then Alex Cyprus in Greece, as well as the, mo the well mo more well-known ones on the right. Because we tend to think of populism as populism, nationalism, anti-immigration, racism. And that is totally partial. If you go to Europe, three major countries' party systems, all the political parties, have been completely transformed in the past 10 years. The Italians, the Greeks, and the Spanish. They will never be the same again. And it's insurgents from the left rather than the right that's actually transformed these places. And there's a left-wing version of this one, and there's a right-wing version of this. So I want to go through both. Short version of how we got here. Apparently, if I walk this far, I disappear. Is that true? Because <laughs> otherwise, I have to stand here under these interrogation lights. So There's a particular episode of Star Trek where... Uh, What's his name again? Jean-Luc Picard was tortured. It's, it's a bit like that. Anyway, short version of how we got here. Uh, by the way, they didn't tell you. I used to do stand-up, and occasionally I'd just diverge into it. So there we go. All right, so back in the day, at the end of World War II, from World War II, 74, well, from 45 to about 75, this is the golden era. And it was the period when something very weird happened that never happened before. The top of the income distribution came down, the bottom went up, and the whole distribution jumped. This is when you got the birth of the American middle classes. This is when British Prime Minister Harold Wilson said to the working people in Britain, you've never had it so good, and he was right. And it was a unique combination of circumstances that produced that world. Mainly the reaction to the Great Depression, fascism, World War II, and the success of the Soviet Union in appealing as an alternative economic model after the chaos of the 20s and 30s. So at the end of that period, we built a world that looked like this, the Cold War era. The policy target was full employment. Regardless of whether you were Sweden or Spain or the United States, that's what the government cared about because we saw the disastrous consequences of mass unemployment on a decade-long period. National economies, what that meant was that capital was sealed off. There was no international banking running around. There was no derivatives trades. There was no mortgage-backed securities. There was silo banking, commercial banks, savings and loans, investment banks. They all did discrete things, and it was all about forcing investment at home. You had highly restricted financial markets. You had big organized labor dealing with big business in big production units. You had cost of living adjustment contracts. All of that made possible a high rate of investment, which led to a high rate of growth, which led to high rates of taxes and transfers. Crucial bit of information, no one knew the name of the person who ran the central bank. Nobody. Now, jump forward to the era that I grew up in. I left Britain in 1991 because of a woman, Mrs. Thatcher. And, <laughs> and I jumped straight into the arms of Bill Clinton. I don't think it was actually such a good idea. But anyway, we went to the neoliberal era. What did that mean? We built a regime that was entirely different. All these different economies, are, they're very different from each other, but they no longer cared about unemployment because they'd had this inflationary crisis. We'll get back to that in a minute. What do we care about now? Price stability. And what do you care about? Globalization. And what does globalization allow you to do? You make stuff really cheaply. Well, yes, because you've globalized your labor markets. So the ability of labor to go on strike, demand higher wages, done. It's over with. Open financial markets. Why? Because capital and technology flowing abroad create those global supply chains that make globalization possible. So the only way you can cope at home is get out of the unions and be more flexible. We have flexible labor markets. And you get much lower taxes, much lower transfers. And here's the weird thing. Everybody knows the name of the person who runs the central bank because they're now the most important person in the country. Two distinct regimes, watch this. That's US corporate profits going from 1960 down to 1992 and back up. Look at that. I wonder what was squeezing them and what made them boom. Here's another one. US inflation all the way up in the 1970s. Boom, 1980, Volcker jacks up interest rates, the long decline in inflation. And then what do you see? Treasury yields, a proxy for interest rates, up and up and up and up, coping with inflation, and then down and down and down to where they are today. Oops, back up. There we go. So what killed that first regime was inflation. 
Nixon vows inflation cut. There's the winter of discontent in Britain where the unions were striking and no one was even getting buried. That was the tabloid story. What actually happened was the ground was frozen so you couldn't bury anyone, but you could always blame the unions. That's actually what happened. And then there's that Ron Chernow uh, claim there, the great inflation destroyed faith in paper assets because if you held a bond, suddenly the bond was worth much less money than it was before. But it was a brilliant time to be a debtor. How many of you took out a mortgage in the 1970s? Come on, put your hand up. You made it like bandits. Because if you had a 3% mortgage and you had 10% inflation, it was great, the bank was eating it and you were getting the capital gain. And then when you elected Reagan, you locked in high real interest rates and your house increased in value. What a deal, it's fantastic. When it failed in the 70s, and the reason it failed was the following. There was a system reset, now here's the failure. Imagine that you've decided that I'm gonna target full employment. And that's going to be my one policy goal. So you're going to run a very tight, restricted set of labor markets. And wages are going to get bid up. To the point that by the time you get to the late 60s, when you're running the Vietnam War off the books, your real unemployment rate's booked 25 to 3%. So how it happens at that point is that the worst guy in your firm can leave work and then walk straight into another job and get a pay rise. The only way that firms can deal with this is by pushing up prices. So they push up prices, then what happens? Labor figures out they haven't really had a pay rise. So they want more money. So they get a pay rise, so they want more money. And it all gets pushed up into inflation. When inflation goes up and up and up like this, guess what happens? It becomes irrational to be an investor. So the investment rate collapses. Unemployment goes up despite the inflation. We get the great stagflation of the 1970s. And what's the solution to stagflation? Hand policy to central bankers because they're not elected. They can't be thrown out of office and they can do the nasty. They can jack up interest rates to 20% when your inflation is 16%, cause a massive hemorrhaging of the economy, a construction of credit, and you get the big recessions that happened in the early 1980s. But it really reset the system because there was a new software written onto that hardware, if you want to use that analogy. And that was the ideas of Thatcher and Reagan and the people behind them. The open markets, price stability, going global, that was the way you do it. The flexibility was good, the labor was bad, that the returns to capital had to go up, otherwise what's the point in running capitalism? That was the neoliberal compact. Now, in 2008, that regime blew up. And if you have a look at this slide, what it shows you is percentage of GDP as bank assets in a selection of countries. So let's have a look at Iceland. Well, that's good. That's about 800% of GDP in bank assets. Let's remember what a bank asset is, folk. Banks call them things assets. Normal people called them debt, <laughs> right? What, so I always try to explain this one, right? So I have a condo in Boston, which is nice. And I have a, a mortgage on the other end of that. Now, the condo is my asset, and it's the bank's liability, because they don't want a condo. They want the money, right? Now, on the other end of that trade is the bank. And the bank looks at it and says, I have an asset. It's called Mark Blythe. And I'm like, wow, you've chosen poorly. But nonetheless, I really am their asset. It's not the condo. They care about the income stream. And assets and liabilities sum to zero. So if you've got a bank that has, in this case, 623% of the economy's total value out there in loans, do you think that might be slightly risky? Aye. And everybody was at that, even those conservative Germans. 86% of German GDP in one bank called Deutsche Bank, which ran average leverage, right, assets to liability, of 60 to 1 on an average Tuesday. That's stable. Aye, that's great. Now, why did we get like this? Because remember that inflation rate that's very high? You kill it with high real interest rates. But then you've got a problem because you liberalize finance when there's 16, 15% interest. Oh my God, it's so easy to make money. I mean, I get 15% just for showing up at Citibank and opening a check account. That's incredible. What a bonanza for savers. This is awesome. So anybody can do this. Remember Wall Street, the movie? Right. Now here's the problem. Those interest rates go down over time because you make more and more financial transactions, you integrate different markets, you open up globally, so the pool of money gets bigger. As the pool of money gets bigger, what happens to the price of money? It falls. What's the price of money? The interest rate. So how do you make money on a declining spread? You pump up the leverage. You do this. And the banking system of the West 
became multiples of the size of the underlying economy. And it was all working great so long as everyone was revolving, revolving credit, whether it was your credit card, your house, your mortgage loan, your corporate book, loan book, whatever it was. So long as it doesn't go bust. But remember, we've, been, we've abolished the business cycle. Everything's fine. We know what we're doing. Then it all blew up. And at that point in time, remember I said the central bankers run the world? Here's why. They bailed the system. In the 1970s, the system failed. It had a heart attack because of inflation. The neoliberals came along and reset the system. They wrote new software for the hardware. We didn't do that in 2008. We let the money doctors come in. And what they did was they pumped 13 trillion of euros, dollars, and yen into the global banking system to keep the system going. It had a heart attack, and we basically put them in intensive care for 10 years. This is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. That's all assets that they have bought from the private sector and swapped it out for money so that the private sector super cheap loans. Do you know what they do with that? Apple sits on the largest pile of cash of any corporate in the world. I think it's about a quarter of a billion, a quarter of a trillion dollars. Uh, rather than using that, they borrowed money because it was so cheap, issued their own bonds, which earns them a premium on top of that, took the cash from that and then bought their own shares back to boost the value of their stock so they could reward themselves even more money. And we book that as investment so they don't pay any taxes. Does anyone else want to call that bull? <laughs> the euro system is no different. In fact, they're in much deeper. So let's bring all this back to populism. Do you think there might be a connection? Let's figure this out. So you can't really see this because I made it all up. No, you can't really see this because it's very small, unfortunately. But let me try and explain what's up here. Percent price changes in consumer goods and services in the US from 97 to 2017. So over a 20 year period, right, what costs more? You know what's at the top of that? College education. You know what the next one is? Health care. You know what the next one is? Child care. You know what's at the bottom? iPads. You can't eat an iPad. And if you can't afford to go to college, what are you going to do apart from sit at home and play games with it? Here's the global story on income. This is called the elephant graph, for obvious reasons. So what it shows here is the real increase in incomes from the poorest person in the world, literally, to the richest. And if you do this by country, what those dots represent at different countries, is you see that basically the countries of East and South Asia have had the largest gains. If you go up to the 45th percentile, that's China. They've been doing quite well. Why? Because they came from here, we were there, and it went like that. Now, when you get to the 67th percentile, you get to the poorest person in the United States. Notice all those incomes have been falling relative to where they've been growing. And in fact, at the bottom of the distribution, it's 78% to 87% the American middle classes, you've taken a real hit. And then, guess what? There's been fantastic gains. That's your 1% in the trunk. Now, who gets this if you break it out for the US? This is quintiles, 20%, 40%, 60%. Guess what? The top 20% have made off with all the cash. And then everybody else has went, eh. And if you're actually in the bottom, eh. Look, it's hardly budged since 1980. And that's true for the bottom three quintiles. So 60% of the country hasn't really had a pay rise when you adjust for inflation since 1980. Meanwhile, people like me on the coasts, we've been lapping it up. I've been having lobster thermidor in the bath. <laughs> Don't tell my wife, she hates when I do that. Here's a clue as to where this broke. Remember that first regime I was talking about? Full employment, captured labor markets, blah, 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 the rest of it. Look, what have you got? 1948 right through 1973, productivity and hourly compensation track each other completely. COLA contracts. Labor's big enough to hurt business, business big enough to hurt labor. You cooperate. Because you have to constantly pay labor more, business is forced to innovate. That's how you maintain your margins. Until the system self-destructs with inflation, because no amount of innovation is going to get you around that. It's a structural problem. So you go for the disinflation solution, you start to globalize your production, you build on the deindustrialization that's been going on from the 70s, the move from here to the south. What do you find? Hourly compensation starts to lag, productivity continues. What's in the gap? That's your 1% trunk. Here's the quintile wage growth. Again, the 20%, the wage quintile, what's actually changed? Hourly wages, who's been making out? Again, the top and the upper middle. 
The middle's barely budged. The bottom two, you can't even talk about it. The bottom has fallen in real terms. Labor share of income. Used to be in the 70s, we'd never had it so good. That's because capital share of income was low and labor share of income was an all-time high. Since then, look what's happened. Down and down and down. Now, this creates a big problem at the end of the day because I like Mitt Romney, but there's only so many fridges he can buy. And you do have a basic consumption problem if you've been running your economy, as we have for the past 30 years, off of credit. And if people's wages aren't rising and they're strapped with too much debt, which banks call credit, remember that little trick, assets and liabilities, then they can't service their debts. If at the same time they're being told, oh, if you don't go to college, you'll never amount to anything. There's no jobs for anyone who doesn't have a college degree these days. I wish I knew what a college degree qualified most people would do, by the way, but we'll put that onto the side for the moment. What is it you end up with? You end up with a world in which your share of the national product is falling, despite the fact that the country has never been richer. And it's not just this country, it's every country. I'm going to take you to Germany at the end of this and show you the story's just the same. This is the zip code distress map. What you see there, are the blue areas on the left-hand side are prosperous communities. The orange are at risk, the red one are distressed. High unemployment, obesity, uh, murder rate, opioid addiction, all of the bads are the red bits. There's the electoral map. It's not a perfect fit because one zip codes and the other one are districts, but it does tell you a story. It might suggest that people who are living in distressed uh, communities don't actually think when politicians show up and say, vote for me jobs, vote for me change, and their community just stagnates and gets worse, that they don't actually update the information and maybe figure out these people are just professional liars. And then when someone comes along and calls on them, they go, I may not like this guy, but he's telling the truth. So how do people survive when wages aren't growing? They borrow. This little graph shows you bank assets, your liabilities, your debts, their income since 1970. Bank loans to GDP, boom, off the scale. Now, this is my favorite advert from the lunacy that was the early 2000s. Citibank had an advertising campaign, cost them $100 million. They spent that on advertising and they're a crap bank. <laughs> so, and they are a crap bank, but anyway, they had this whole advertising. This is an example of an open a cravings account, right? This is from 2005, just before the bust. Do you, do you remember what the advertising slogan for the whole campaign was? Five bucks to anybody who knows this. Live richly. You remember this? Right? Not save up and buy yourself something nice or you might want to put something away and use the power of compound interest. No, just live richly. How can we do that? In 2004, I lived in Baltimore. I went away for two weeks. I couldn't open the door when I came home because I had so many credit card offers. <laughs> Out of control. Now, that's where this goes. Remember that thing about labor shares declining? All the incomes go to top 20%. This is Euro area consumer credit. There's US consumer credit. Look at the jump. That's people borrowing to fill in that gap. That's what banks, that's why the banking's so big. Because every single one of us is running a deficit. For, I'm 50 years old. For everybody who's 50 years old or older, do you remember a time when you didn't have credit cards? Yes, right. For everybody who's under 50, that happened, <laughs> right? And, we used to have this thing called the state that ran deficits for us and paid for stuff. But now you do it yourself through student loans, through revolving lines of credit, through borrowing from your house as if it's an ATM. Because that's what you're using to fill in the gap. Because the cost of college has gone up 150% in real terms. Whereas your wages, if you're in the middle of the distribution, have barely budged. This is Euro area wage growth. 2008, 2017. Even the Europeans with their bigger welfare states, same trend. And there's the wage share of GDP again, same as we saw before, labor share falling off. So what happens when you bail out that massively levered system in 2008, when regime two has the heart attack and the money doctors come in? This is where all the debt came from. It wasn't that we went on an orgy of spending, that's why I got pissed off enough to write that book, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea. This was the greatest bait and switch in human history, folks. 
What actually happened was the banking sectors of all the advanced countries blew up. And rather than them taking their losses, they told the politicians, oh my God, there'll be no money in the ATMs. Think what will happen. The whole world will die. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but like all good stories, it makes you afraid. So what do you do? You open up the monetary taps and you bail them out. And you run large deficits, which lead to more debt. You recapitalize the financial institutions. You do all the stuff that produces, in the American case, a giant raise in the amount of federal debt. And the same in the EU, despite the fact that they're not even one country. All the buying of those assets, putting it on the balance sheet, handing them the cash, they then issue the bonds, buy back their own share price, and we still don't have a pay rise. It's called financial engineering. 13 trillion in central bank interventions later, here's the funny thing, there's no inflation. See, at the start of the crisis, the one big fear was, if the government steps in and starts spending all this money, it'll be like Germany in the 1920s, there'll be this huge hyperinflation, and it'll be terrible. And inflation's been falling and falling and falling and falling. Here's why. Remember I mentioned the 1970s was very important. It was that moment when the inflationary crisis took hold and broke the post-war model of capitalism. Ooh, did we get that wrong? Here's my favorite graph in the world. You ready? Because I've got a few, but this one's a topper. <laughs> I got this from a guy who smuggled it out of the cabinet office of the Japanese prime minister. It's fantastic, right? <laughs> well, that's why it's all in Japanese, right? But what does it show you? It shows you interest rates since 1350. Now, when you get to, I know it's brilliant, right? When you get to this, stay with me, pay attention. <laughs> I know it's fun, but it's worth it. Now look, here's the thing. Back, you all watch Game of Thrones, right? Right, so Game of Thrones, hi, I'm the king, I'd like to borrow some money. I'm the Iron Bank of Bravos. You know what happens, everybody dies. So in that world, you have very high real interest rates because if you get a bond from a government, they might rip you off. There's no secondary market where you buy and swap different bonds around to offset the risk. So you have very high real interest rates. The Italians and the Dutch come along in the 15th, 16th century and invent a secondary market for government debt. That starts to grow rapidly, the risk dissipates. And then by the time that you get to the 1700s, real interest rates are below 4%. The Brits can issue a perpetual bond, a forever bond to fight the Napoleonic Wars at 3%, and it's oversubscribed. By the time you get to 1941, the real rate of interest is 1.88. So the long run real rate of interest for the global economy is 2%. Then there's the 70s. All the inflation is in the 70s because of the one unique confluence of events that was that post-war regime and its breakdown. But all of the economics we've ever learned is based upon the experience of that one bit of the time series. Everything else is forgotten. Here's what is, why this is important. That's the federal funds rate. Forget the financial crisis. Where's that been going? Down and down and down. Here's the four big central banks in the world. Down and down and down. 1980s inflationary crisis, all the way down. Banks build up leverage on the way up, pop. Interest rates are still down. There's no inflation in the system. Why? Because it's labor that produces inflation. And once you've globalized your labor markets, there's no inflation anymore. Why can't Janet Yellen bring interest rates up? Why can't Draghi buy interest rates anymore? Because there's no reason to. There's no inflation. Why would you do it? You'd simply slow down the economy. But what does that mean for savers? What does that mean for pension funds? Whoops. Now, add this all together, and in my opinion, you get populism. Debts are too high. Wages are too low to pay off the debt. Inflation's too low to eat the debt. You can't play the trick you did in the 70s when you got a mortgage. It's the other way around. This is a creditor's paradise, not a debtor's paradise. The left response is blame capital and blame globalization. And they're not blameless. The right response, blame immigration, blame globalization. We can disagree on the immigrants one, but they're basically hitting on the same thing. Now, the results of this are creditor-debtor standoffs gunfights, if you will, at the level of states, at the level of localities, at the level of communities. What you have is a situation now where there's no inflation, interest rates are really low, where your debts are stable, but it's very hard to service them. And all the laws have been written to the advantage of creditors now. You can't declare personal bankruptcy on student loans, etc., etc. So what do you have? The real value of debt goes up, but your ability to collect goes down. What does that do? Who are the losers? 
the pro-globalization left parties of the 1990s, the German Social Democrats, New Labour, Clinton's version of the Democrats, pff, credibility is gone. They're dead. Who are seen as the new stars? All of this lot. Bernie, Podemos, Five Star. Who's on the other side of this? Debtors. The winners, in the most perverse sense, can't pay, won't pay, to hell with you. That's your Trump voters. That's your Le Pen voters. It's also the left voters. It's just expressed in a different way. People have seen the system systematically not work for them. And what do you get there? That's when it's coded through nationalism and coded against immigrants. AFD, the Finns, Fidesz, Law and Justice, all the right-wing versions. Back to that one slide, both sides. Same thing producing both. Now, in closing, a deeper dive into the German elections. For a while, it seemed it was all going so well. <laughs> We'd got rid of the populace. Europe was growing. I, I mean, I love the, what politician in the right mind gets that picture taken and doesn't think J James Bond bad guy. <laughs> right? It, it, it's just perfect, right? And, and Marines on the other side of it are like, immigrants, the door is over there. You know, just go away, please. So anyway, they got turfed, so it was like, it was good, it was all fine. People in Brussels are very happy, right? Uh, and then this happened. The economy was going well. So obviously people were going to vote in their interests, right? We don't have to worry about the German elections, it's fine. Look, here's our GDP, it's going up, finally. You notice they always put forecast in there in small print. And then here's unemployment going down, forecast, right? But things are moving in the right way. Just in the same way that the Democrats simply didn't get it that when they were wandering around America in the campaign, telling everyone that things have never been so good, that unemployment's back to where it was before the crisis, that things are great for millions of Americans, they were like, are you got rocks in your head? Have you been to where I live? All you need to do is walk, I'm, in, I'm a living in Providence, Rhode Island, really, really wealthy little part where around where the university is, the east side. I just need to drive two miles, and I can take my students to places where there are pawn shops, the, some of the major businesses are uh, mobile shops, the, the, the networks these students have never heard of. Two completely different Americas, all in the one city. You can bike from one side to the other. And yet, we think in averages. On average, wages have gone up. On average, unemployment's gone down. We don't live on an average. It's all skewed. It's all gone to the top 20. Now, the thought in Europe it was over. Everything was heading in the right direction. And then this happened. We're back. So what you've got, the black at the top there, is Merkel's party, the coalition on the right. 33%. It's the worst they've done in recorded history. The SPD, the helper up from the left, the people who are meant to offer an alternative, but have been in the coalition basically pushing this agenda along, they're down at their worst result ever. Have a look at the winners and losers on this one. It's the two mainstream parties that have lost. Who's up on the other side? It's the alternatives. It's in this case, it's the right ones. Now, here's the two faces of the German economy. This is this whole story about everything's fine. Why is everyone whining about it? It's not the economics. So here's real GDP per capita average growth rate, 7 to 16. Germany outstripping everybody. They sell BMWs to the rest of the world. They're awesome. We buy them. It's that simple, right? Here's declining unemployment, right? Going down and down. This is 2016-17. Down from 4.3. We'd kill for 4.3. We've got 4.3, but the way we calculate unemployment is really weird. And then they're down now to basically 3.7. They've got over full employment. They have a shortage of skilled workers. So why is everyone complaining? Well, here's why. Uh, this is poverty and development. Uh, have a look at that purple line. That's the poverty rate. Right? Now, this came from two sources. Number one, buying East Germany. Basically, 17 million unemployed communists showed up and said, give me a job. You had to integrate them into your economy. That costs a lot of money. And the lander, the eastern lander, are the ones where you still have the number of pe highest number of people in poverty, on social benefits, etc. Now, for the past 10 years, the German government, like everyone else, has been saying, we need to tighten our belts, we need to pay back our debt, we need to cut back this welfare state, we can't afford it anymore. But at the same time, what are they doing? They're opening their door to 2 million refugees. So what does that look like to the people who are the recipients sitting in the east? who have seen their industry stripped, their country destroyed, and their homes devalued, while the rest of the West is doing fine. And now they're meant to accept a bunch of immigrants. They seem to get all the welfare transfers. How come I can't get my school renovated? You can see how this one plays out. 
This is the election results in East and West Berlin. This is one city that used to be divided. 20 years ago, the division is still there. What you see in the West, Merkel's party, 34%. In the East, 27%. AFD, the right wing upstarts, the immigration party, West Berlin, 10.9, 21.6. That's in one city. Identity politics do matter, but all identity is coded through economics. You can't explain a rise in the number of racists by virtue of a rise in the number of racists. You need to explain where it comes from. And where it comes from in the German elections, which I think is very, very germane for thinking about this problem in general, is what is it unique about this one area? Why is it that if you're in the East, you're far more likely to have a higher level of xenophobia than the West, even when you control for age? Well, part of the fact is, go back to the prior slide, you live in the area that's deprived. You live in the area that since 1991 has been in the receipt of transfers. And now you feel you're in competition for those transfers with a bunch of people who have come into your country that you didn't invite. Do you think populists can pick up on this and make this into a politics? And if the center parties are unable to talk about it, unable to explain rationally why they should want to make these choices, then the result's inevitable. And the tragedy in the German case, and this argument could be extended here and everywhere, is the following. The West is old. The West is rich but you didn't have enough kids. There are 1.4 new Germans for every two that are there just now. Their economy is shrinking. The whole of Europe is just below two in its replacement rate. So that means one of two things. Either, if an economy is nothing more than the number of workers, number of hours worked, and the amount of capital, if you take out the number of workers, you have a shrinking pie. Given that the pie is already skewed in its distribution, that's going to get ugly. So the solution would be immigrants, because they can come in, you can put their kids in your system, you can tax them across the generations, they pay for your debts, they pay for your old care, they pay for your pensions. Or you can do the stupidest thing ever. You can say no to that and demand that you want more, which seems to be what people are doing. Here's an interesting one. This is contact with immigrants. People in the West have far more contact with immigrants than people in the East. But at the East is where they voted for the AFD. So how do you explain that? Because it's not even contact with real people. It's the imaginary that these people are taking things from me. That's a pure populist creation. So why do people vote against those who work against their best interests? Well, it's not clear to me that's the case. It's not clear that the populists are really the problem, even on the right or even on the left. See, there's a presumption that we had that the mainstream parties were working for them. And it turned out it wasn't true. I'll give you a little bit of anecdata from this, and you can check it out. Um, in the Guardian newspaper, Tom Frank wrote about this. It's the obvi most obvious site to get a link to it. Um, anyway, here's the story. When they did the Podesta email hacks, when they got the Democrats' um, emails, somebody took the data from WikiLeaks and decided to do what's called geolocate the data. In other words, what were the place names that the leading Democrats, who are the left party who are meant to represent all of us, remember, right? Not the elite Republicans. Uh, what were the place names that they talked about in their private communications in this election? What was the number one most frequently named place in their communications? Can you guess? Have a guess. Martha, Martha's Vineyard, yeah. Number two, East and Southampton, then New York, then San Francisco, then I think it was LA and DC, and the rest of the country, two standard deviations out. So what's the imaginary of a party that seeks to represent all, if that's all the places that they talk about because that's where the money is? And it's not just to castigate the Democrats. The British Labour Party was like this under Blair. The German SPD under Schroeder has done this. The left has systematically failed the people that it supposedly represents. So why should we be in the least surprised that they defect and then go to anyone at all that actually says, hey, I know that everyone's ignored you for 25 years. I at least hear the fact that you're crying and I understand why. People's everyday experience is very different from a national average. Walking out and telling people that the price of iPads has fallen, which means that really they've got more money than they think, at a time when they can't afford to send their kids to college, or their kids would be insane to take on that much debt, because it's like having a house with no asset. It's just patronizing. 
And the example of immigration, I'll go back to that one, it's very different depending on where you live. Immigration to me is another person from another interesting country who has a PhD, <laughs> right? That, that's what it means where I live, right? But that's because I'm in the top 20%. If you're living in public housing in France, right, and those resources are being finite and those resources are being cut, and you're the ones that are confronted with incredibly different cultures coming in, not integrating with you, taking the resources from you, at least as you perceive it. And that's what's been narrated by the National Front. Don't expect them not to make inroads because it gels with everybody's common sense, regardless of whether we can say, well, on average, immigrants benefit the economy. No one lives in an average. Now, the problem here, and I'll close with this, is that you can identify with all of that, and I hope to understand populism, people begin to accept that, because it's not joining one side or the other. To understand the phenomena, to defeat a phenomena, you need to understand it. But it's the problem is over here. Their economic policies are, are trash. They can't work. The first one is explained with immigration and debt. You need more immigrants, not less, or you're going to go bankrupt. Now think about this one, this country. 80% of all financial assets are held by baby boomers. 80% of those assets are held by 20% of baby boomers. They're going to get liquidated in the next 20 years because everybody dies. And when they do, it will either be spent in the most inefficient way possible, running down those assets until you qualify for Medicare, which is just insane, or it will lead to the greatest non-work transfer of wealth in the history of the Republic, whereby an entire generation inherits a huge amount of cash for doing nothing. That's not good. Globalization, Walmart, wages, it's all a problem, but there's also an upside to this. The only reason people are actually able to eat just now is because of global supply chains. If you want to tear all that down, exactly where are you going to get not just your kiwi fruit from, your very basics, given how complex the interdependencies in the world economy are. So simply turning inwards, there's a country that tries this. It's called North Korea. It's not very good. Globalization has certainly harmed a lot of jobs but not as much as you think. The main culprit has been technology and also labor migration. What do I mean by that? Wisconsin lost one third of its jobs, not to Mexico, but to Texas and Florida and other right to work states back in the 1970s. We've been industrializing for a very long period and particularly in manufacturing, capital substitutes for labor really efficiently, not so in services. Largest, fastest, largest volume growing job in the United States, elder care nurse and home help because that's where we need it, because the baby boomers are getting older and they need the help, right? But in manufacturing, robots will take everything. But this has been going on for 50 years, so the notion that this is NAFTA, NAFTA is a rounding error on this. And if you try and dismantle all that, all you do is piss off the Canadians. Nobody wants to do that. <laughs> they, will, they will deny us maple syrup. <laughs> An NFL. It's not worth it. And finally, the last one, I'll come back to this, is aging. At the end of the day, we're an older society, and an older society is one that saves too much and invests too little. Because when you're at the, to, to sound like an economist, when you're at the end of the life cycle, you care about present consumption. So you don't care about the ability of somebody else you don't know to go to college. So you vote for tax cuts, because that's in your immediate interest, because you want to leave it all to your kids. But the world that your kids are going to grow up in is the one that everybody else's kids are growing up in. And if 80% of them think the system's bust, and 66% of you here think the system's bust by the voting I saw earlier, then it doesn't matter how much you try and self-insure through assets for your own kids. You're leaving them in the country. Don't do that. And the first step to that is very simple. Go back to that graph. Imagine what would happen if you had free college tuition. 60 billion a year would do it. We spend more on DARPA and the Defense Research Institutes. Subsidized childcare. Imagine what it would actually be like if women, particularly single mothers, were actually able to be active members of the workforce rather than being general stress cases as they spend 60% of their take-home pay getting their kids looked after so they can put 40% on the table to feed them. Every other country in the world has managed to have a single-payer healthcare system. It's just more efficient. We spend 17% of GDP on healthcare. Everybody else spends about seven. 10% of American GDP is more money than I could spend on a Victoria's Secret supermodel. And that's a lot of money. Imagine what we could do with that. 
Something that really would help, we have this obsession with short-termism. Quarterly reports, shareholder value. What that means is, I've met tons of CEOs and they all say the same thing. I would love to invest in communities. I would love to do more long-term R&D. I'd love to onshore stuff, I really would, but I can't. Because if somebody gets control of 5% of my shares, usually some activist idiot from a hedge fund, then they will come in and replace the entire board because they're not maximizing the share price. Well, how about we change corporate incentives by changing the law to stop that nonsense? And then you'll be more like German corporations. And then we could make the BMWs for a change. <laughs> and finally, the last one. Why is it okay for Facebook and Google to know more than the CIA about who you are? <laughs> and then to sell that for profit? And Equifax to have all your details? and then lose it and go, whoops. What's happening is we're building these winner-take-all digital monopolies, the margins on which are incredible. Imagine you have a 60% profit margin because the cost of providing your marginal cost to your next good is zero, which is what these guys have. So what's their incentive to invest? Well, they we'll send a rocket to the moon and we're doing deep mind, yeah, whatever, great. But what's your actual investment in communities? What's your investment in labor? Well, you don't have to have one, it's just scalable tech. So because of that, your costs are incredibly low, your returns are unbelievably high, you're making money for just showing up, and because you're a monopolist, huge barriers to entry, nobody else gets to play. That's what we're turning the economy into. So it's a rentier's paradise. It doesn't work to work. It only pays to be one of those guys. We can't all be one of those guys. So a simple way to do it is just follow that. Those five things, just do that and you'll kill populism in a heartbeat. And if you don't, don't be surprised if they're in charge. Thanks. Professor, for your inspiring and, and propose solutions at the end. At this time, Dr. Blythe will take questions from the audience. Please submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag ENThompsonForum. You may also write questions on note cards which are provided by the ushers. Our first question this evening comes from the students, the E.N. Thompson International Scholars. Professor Blythe, do you believe that American people voted against their best interests due to a deteriorating trust for the system? And if so, do you think the 2008 financial crisis could have been the beginning? I think it has begun long before the financial crisis. The financial crisis exacerbated what was going on, but the genetic collapse in trust in public institutions has been a long time coming and has many, many causes, some of which I've talked about there. So, but I don't think people vote against their best interests. I really don't. I, I will defend the right, of the, most hard, hard, the, the right of the most hardcore Trump voter to vote for Trump. Because if at the end of the day, your life experience says, I really don't believe a word that anybody else says, and this guy may be a horse peddler, but he speaks my type of language. Right. I mean, put it this way. Here's, here's a way to think about this. I'm quite serious. If you really think every, someone's a liar, there is no point in putting any investment in them. You will be disappointed. If you think someone's a artist, there might be an upside. <laughs> right? Why not? On the other hand, if things get worse, they finally get worse for the top 20%. Welcome to my downside. Germans have a word for this, it's called Schadenfreude. Right, Nobody what, thinks that way, I do. I'm evil in some sense, but there we go. Anyway, that's, that's my sincere answer. Mark, what do you think about the free health care in the UK? Does it work because of the country's size or another reason? Uh, you can do it on all sorts of scales. It doesn't have to be one giant bureaucracy. I mean, the NHS is a bit kind of out of control. It's too hierarchical. It tries to serve the entire nation. You can have devolved, regionally funded versions of this that share costs across things. Uh, my basic point is everybody else has managed to do this, and they all spend less than we do, usually half. And, you know, healthcare outcomes, longevity, Japan kicks ass, right? Quality of life, less stress, Spain tops the list. Not this weekend, things are kicking off, but usually, right? There's lots of different ways you can look at this. If you want sort of like highly stressed out societies with lots of social problems, we rock, right? In part because we work too many hours. And because of that, we're totally stressed, so we consume far too many pharmaceuticals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just a question of the nature of this, the payer system. It's what do you expect healthcare to do? 
And that's part of a larger conversation we need to be about what are we trying to do because we're all just running to stay still, apart from a few of us who have managed to basically take the cake. And really, until we get to the heart of that, everything else is scurrying around the issue. All right, thank you. We'll stay in the United Kingdom. Why did the Brits vote for Brexit? Because they're morons. <laughs> Next question. So, so all right, th this is when it becomes comedy, but it's also tragedy, and the best comedy is tragedy, right? So here's the way it worked before. The Brits had the thing called the pound, right? It's cute. I had a picture of Elizabeth on it, right? Now, they were never going to join the euro. And because they were never going to join the euro, they didn't have to put up with any of the nonsense of the Germans and their perpetual belt tightening, right? Any of that crap. They didn't have to put up with all these rules called the fiscal compact and the deficit reduction procedure. They were never going to join. And the best thing about being a country is having your own money. Because if your banking system goes poof, you can print money to save it if you want. Um, you can also decide not to. Uh, you can take a hit through the exchange rate because you have one. So you basically default slowly on foreigners in your cash rather than on your own people. If you don't have your own currency, if you give that up, you can't do any of these tricks. And what that means is either you let everything default, you blow up the banking system, which would be for the whole of Europe, which would be crazy, or alternatively, you squeeze internal devaluation. Welcome to Greece, right? Why is Greece in such a suit? That's why they don't have their own money. Now, the Brits are smart enough to go, we're never giving this up. We're one of the big three. We get to like, tell the Germans and the French, no, we're not doing that, no, we're not doing that. We get to veto anything we don't like. We have our own massive financial sector, which is really big and earns just tons of money. We get to clear all these euro transactions. We have this lovely little hedge currency between the euro and the dollar called the pound. It's deep and it's liquid. Our property markets are the biggest money laundering scheme on the planet, right? We have the best deal ever. David Cameron renegotiated the best deal ever and then decided he didn't like it, took it to the British people and said, what do you think of the EU? And they basically said, we don't know, but we hate you. Because <laughs> it wasn't really about the EU. It was about to the elites, basically. And then the result came in and they went, oh, crap. So they handed it to May and now May has to negotiate the best deal ever, having defaulted on the best deal ever twice. So in my book, they're morons. Now, is that fair? Yeah, if you're going to decide on someone as, as complex and important as the EU, have a debate about the EU. Don't make up stuff about 350 million a week for the healthcare system if we don't pay taxes to Brussels. You might as well turn around and say, well, Mark Blythe would be seven foot tall if he didn't eat carrots, <laughs> right? There's just as much factual content in that one. But we've got this world now where like, you have to give both sides of the, of the debate an answer. All right, over here we have someone with facts and knowledge and data, and over here we have a complete lunatic. Let's give them equal time. That was basically the Brexit vote. <laughs> All right, let's take some rapid-fire questions from our rapidly filling up Twitter feed this evening. First, what happens when there are no more jobs because robots have taken them all? Robots can't take them all for the simple reason that the fastest growing jobs for the next 20 years are going to be looking after baby boomers. And they haven't invented that robot yet. <laughs> when we talk about robots, once you get out of manufacturing, which is shrinking everywhere because you can efficiently add robotic processes, what you're really talking about is things called algorithmic processes, right? Can machines learn to do things? And if they can, can those tasks be routinized in such a way that they can do them much faster and much more efficiently? This is where you're taking jobs. Now, where are you taking jobs? Number one, the financial sector. Why? Because they've lent all this money and we're not borrowing anymore because our wages aren't going up. So the only way they're going to maintain their margins is if they cut their costs. So what do they do? They're automating the whole back office. It's called fintech, financial technology, right? They are the jobs that are actually more vulnerable to this than anything else. Manufacturing is going the way of 19th century manufacturing. It has been replaced by something better and smarter. What bothers me is what happens when you have concentration of returns to assets. It's not about the robots. It's about who controls the returns to robots. Because if a handful of monopolistic digital firms actually control these technologies, they're just going to basically extract rents from the rest of society and pay us whatever they see fit. That's when it becomes really problematic. But it's not about robots, right? That's not the one to worry about. So I, the second thing, I must say this as well, it's actually very important. Every time that there's been a technological revolution, there has been a net increase in the size of the labor market, not a decrease. So why should this time be different? Well, because it's digital, it's different, it's going to happen so fast, blah, blah, blah. 
Sweden, very high tax and transfer society, welfare state, big state, the whole lot, right? Number two in the world for startups, very technologically advanced. 5% of their transactions last year were cash. Everything else is digital. They're already a digital society. They've still got employment. Let's have a little faith here. We remember the jobs that have been lost. We're unable to picture the jobs that will be there. I still have faith that that's the case. All right, considering how it has destroyed some economies, do you think debt has a place in them? Well, remember, debt's not a bad thing, unless you speak German. <laughs> Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Nein. Yeah? Also, was ist die Worte für uh, debt? Schuld, which is the same word as guilt. I'm not making this up. I wish I were. Any Italians here or Italian speakers? Anybody speak Italian? Catholics. Any Catholics here? Come on. Half the town's Catholic. What's the middle of the mass called where you profess your faith? The credo comes from the Italian and Latin credere, to credit. Ah. So you've got a bunch of people who think debt is guilt, and you've got another bunch of people who think debt is credit. What's the secondary meaning of credit in English? To believe. What's the credo? The profession of faith. The whole thing's based on faith. You just believe you're going to get paid back. That's it. Now, you can have an attitude to that that like debt is an obligation and it must be paid back. Or you can say, no, the reason you get paid an interest rate is because you're taking a risk. Here's the risk. You might not get paid back. It's not a moral obligation. So debt is the opposite of credit. Assets are the opposite of liabilities. There's nothing wrong with debt. It's a question of who's been asked to bear it. And if you're asking people to take on debt that you know they can't pay back, you're a predator. Based on your proposed solutions, are there any U.S. politicians who can get elected? I think so. I do. And he'll be too old to do it himself, but I'm a big believer in Bernie. <laughs> the reason being, uh, apparently he's not the nicest guy. I, can't, I don't know, but he seems very avuncular. Who knows, right? But that's irrelevant. Who cares about personalities? It's what you're saying. What are you putting on the platform? What are you actually telling us? And he's actually pointing out, Good God, if we could save 10% of GDP, you wouldn't need to have 1.2 trillion in student loan debt weighing down the next generation. So basically, save it in healthcare, you can just wipe out the student loan problem. This is simple accounting. Why are we giving guaranteed interest rate repayments to commercial banks to give you students loans which you can't default on because you're not allowed to? That's called usury. That's ridiculous. It's not a debt if you can't default on it. It's not a moral obligation to go back to the earlier one. So I think that he's on the right track. Now, somebody else is going to take this on. I think that the world changes in cycles, just like these regimes. And I'll give you an example just now in Britain. May is dead. The Conservative Party is dead. Their message is dead. There's a guy you've heard of called Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn's the leader of the Labour Party. He basically bought out the Labour Party as a kind of completely unfunded leverage buyout of a dead institution. And he walked in and said, let's actually talk about things that might make a difference in the lives of ordinary people. And everyone said, you outdated 1980s socialist, go away. So he's completely pillared in the press and he's meant to be a moron, whatever, fine. There's a brilliant book about the 1970s by Perlstein called The Invisible Bridge. Has anybody ever read it? No? I highly recommend it. Big book, big history book. The 70s were bonkers. The young people have no idea how mental it was, right? And it's a book about the 70s, but it's also a book about Ronald Reagan. And in 1969, he was on the board of regents of the University of California, Berkeley, and he was going on about free speech and the repression of speech amongst right-wing students. And he was given a damn about religious rights, and he didn't think the government should be in our affairs and all the stuff that Reagan stood for. And this was the summer of love. Like, never had someone been so long and wrong in a historical moment. He was a laughing stock. By the end of that decade, the entire world had come to him. He hadn't changed at all. Everything else had moved and joined up. I think we're undergoing a similar transition. I think that the money doctor saved the regime that was born in 78 and died in 2008. They pumped it along on monetary life support, but ultimately it's bankrupt financially, intellectually, and morally. And I think particularly the young generation see this. 
the recent British election where had it run for another few days, Corbyn would have won, despite the fact that every pundit was producing projection after projection saying landslide for the Conservatives. And also, you can think about Trump's victory the same way. People have had enough. And one way or another, they're going to vote for change. I think there are positive and progressive forces out there, and that all we need to do is bide our time. There's that moment of change is coming again, where the people who are laughed at will be the ones where the world comes to them. Mark, why did the, world, why did the word China not appear in your talk? Uh, because they paid me not to. <laughs> I'm a paid Fair agent enough. of the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> Uh, well, it depends how you handle it. I mean, look, so here, here's my shtick on China. Uh, they're back. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Shanghai, go to the Chinese Museum, the Shanghai Museum of Urban Planning. I think they call it that to make sure you don't go. Um, but when you go in, it's kind of a car park. It's like a square Guggenheim, so rather than being round, right, with paintings, it's square. And you go in, and the first one, it's all calligraphy. And you go, it's a big piece of Chinese writing, and it says something like, 3,800 BC, dig a ditch. And you go along like a few feet and there's another big bit of calligraphy and the translation at the bottom. And while you're at it, clean up the trash. And then you go along, it's another 100 years and it says, and while you're at it, get that rowdy lord from down the stairs and put them in jail. And you go along and it says, and then put in street lights, right? And then by the time, you know, you go up and it's like, by the time that my people were running around painting themselves blue and eating each other, right? They're like, oh, we need to figure out a public education system. We're going to allot this much of the budget for doing this and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, this is like, you know, year zero for us, like right? the, the beginning of the age of Christ, right? So what you do is you walk up and you go, holy crap, these guys have been around for a long time. <laughs> and what you're also getting is a message, this is the Chinese state. This is what we do. Don't get in the way. So you get up to where they get to the opium wars and the complete breakdown of China, which I believe our memory, memory says me right, they call the European Interregnum or something, an anodyne like this. It takes up like half a wall. Then there's Mao. You'd think that would be a big thing. Seriously, he gets one panel. And then you open the door. You ever seen the film Mission Impossible? They have a scale model of, Ch of Shanghai. And they got guys on wires coming down, putting the buildings in. Hi, we're back, right? Now, why are they doing this? It's a show of the power of the state. And that's the way that works. That's the way their economy works. They're not top-down communists. Don't think that for a minute. They're the most fiscally decentralized country in the world. 80% of their public expenditure is spent at the local level. Like when we talk about giving back to the states, like the Republicans' master plan would be half of what China's already achieved because they've got 1.2 billion people. So they have regions which have 100 million people in them. You can do a lot of experiments. You can get things wrong and still get things right. They are very robust to shocks. Now, we don't let them buy stuff. We have a thing called the National Security Foreign Investment Act of 2007. They can't buy guns, can't buy tech, can't buy pharma. <laughs> go away. So we sell them stuff, they sell it through a Walmart, they get dollars, we make them buy treasury bills. They're fed up doing that, they're not stupid. So they've got this project called One Belt, One Road. If we're not allowing them to buy assets here, they will go form assets elsewhere. They're investing $40 billion in ports in Pakistan. They've already built a railway that stretches right across Transcaucasia. You can bet that those nice compliant governments in Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and the rest of it will make sure that nobody ever buys anything near that railway line. You'll bet that that railway line will be moving freight trains at 300 miles an hour while we're still dealing with a seller. And on those freight trains will be all the goods that Europe can possibly want to consume. They'll just bypass us. Now, you can either engage with that you can get into a stupid fight with that over some islands, which is utterly pointless because at the end of the day, it's their neighborhood, not yours. And more to the point, unless you're willing to actually invade them, occupy them and kill them, don't try. We've been doing a lot of that. It's usually working out badly, right? <laughs> so they're just going to bypass us and do the thing. You can either engage with that and sort our own house out as the most powerful country in the world, as the richest country in the world. We still got so much we can do. Or we can retreat inward and worry about China as a threat and say that we can't have healthcare and we can't do this and we can't do that while all the profits go to a tiny handful of people who are telling us all that stuff. I don't want to do that.
Do you believe there is a tech bubble or entrepreneurial facade that promotes a false sense and lack of genuine, genuine innovation? Oh my God, yes, absolutely. And what's it called, Juicero? Anybody hear about this one? Or Juicera or one of these things? You know about this one? So a couple, you know, millions of dollars of Silicon Valley money into this wonderful thing whereby, you know those green juices you get usually at airports and you drink them because you're about to get on a plane and you don't want to die, but nobody actually likes them? Right. <laughs> So imagine you could make this at home. Well, I can't. I can put in a blender and press go, right? <laughs> no, no, no. To get the real nutrients out, what you need is a press, which has like the power of seven planets, gravitational, whatever, right? And then you get it. So basically, you buy this bag of fruit, and you put it in this big press, and it goes, Aah! and all this just comes out, and it's amazing, right? So millions and millions and millions of dollars into a technology which we already have called a fruit press. But anyway, it's fancy, right? So they put this in, and some guys in the Wall Street Journal got one of these things and went, I don't believe for a minute it says that it's like the power of three suns or whatever it is, right? So they put it on, and they squeezed the juice, and they got the juice bag, and one of them held it, and the other one squeezed it, and they got more juice out squeezing it. <laughs> this actually happened. End of company, right? So all the sort of like unicorn stuff that's out there that people refer to, this is a status competition. There was an economist at the turn of the century called Thornston Veblen. He wrote the, the, the theory of the leisure class, and it really applies to today as much as it did then when the Vanderbilts and all that were around. It's about showing off that you're part of the community, that you're another Silicon Valley entrepreneur with your finger on the pulse, investing in the latest thing. Why? Because that's what your buddy does, and you're all in the same club together, and you're now all 50, and you're buying blood from third world children and giving yourself infusion so you can live forever. That goes on. So I've heard. But anyway, <laughs> it's a status competition. Does it really matter if you lose the money? No, because you've got so much. So, you know, when you talk about being on the technological frontier, right, we're there. When you do the next big innovation, it's not another app on my phone that I'm not going to use. I mean, I'll give Elon Musk his due. He's somebody who genuinely impresses me. If you can honestly go to Puerto Rico and rebuild their grid and do it with renewables, Give the man the job, right? Fantastic. <laughs> but if it turns out you're basically somebody who's using this as an excuse to bail out a bankrupt solar company, shame on you. How or why do you think race and immigration becomes the lightning rod for populist anger? Is it simply a convenient scapegoat? I think it's more than that. I think it's easy to mobilize against it because it's a definite other. Right, so, you know, the United States, the classic one, is, and it's, I've lived here 27 years, right, but it's just continued to fascinate me. I've lived in Baltimore, incredibly divided city, right? I've lived in, in uh, Providence, which is completely undivided, mainly because there aren't any African Americans, really. The main ones are Portuguese and Italians, and that's sort of like less divisive. So, there's incredible division in this country, particularly the legacy of slavery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yet, this is the number one country for immigration. And yet, lots of other immigrants come across from all over the world. And immigrant, this, this city itself is a big uh, mi a migration center for uh, refugees. So on the one hand, you've got that. On the other hand, you have this. Now, every country has a version of this. It may not be as deep as the one in the United States and the trauma of slavery. But for example, in France, you've got the trauma of colonialism. So then you have the withdrawal from North Africa, the legacy of what they call the Pied Noir, the ones who had to come back and liquidate everything there and come back to France. Now they're being followed in by the Arabs that they'd left behind. They're the ones who are taking the houses from the working classes and the public housing. Right? So it depends on where you are in the country, what the legacy is, how does that get interpreted. If you're in an area where you have zero um, contact with immigrants, as I showed you with the East German slides, you can still be more anti-immigrant than the people who have contact with immigrants. So it's how this is a product of historical narrative, a product of personal experience, and a product of the deep political culture of these countries. But the bottom line is, economics is always expressed in a cultural frame. Only in our models do we imagine something called a representative agent that runs through life jumping and adjusting to shocks and maximizing their utility. That's not what real people do. Real people have stories and they live their lives through those stories. And sometimes those stories are colored by very ugly things. And that's just part of life that we have to accept and try and improve upon. Mark, what should baby boomers be doing with their assets? Giving them away. Last question, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much, Mark. <laughs>
this is this one's uh, what role this is from our uh, Twitter feed this evening what role does the study of leadership play in how we balance government society education and give others a fair <coughs> chance so leadership is way more as I get older I realize that leadership is way more important than I thought it was when I was younger because you know leaders are annoying right it's like the person who wants to be class captain right nobody really likes them you have an election because you have to they're annoying it gives them something to do right you know it's called washington dc right you know so they all end up there and there's a, there's a way in which when you're younger particularly like, pff, leadership whatever then as you get older and you start to be in charge of things and run things you recognize the massive difference that leadership can make that somebody with an actual clear vision who can gain the trust of the people around them can take something that seems utterly bankrupt and transform it. And how somebody who's a leader who thinks they're good can do incredible damage. So it's, un it's actually really important. But when it comes to the big scale questions, the big government questions, I think it's actually less important. Right? So one of the students in an earlier chat gave me a question and it prompted the following response. I think the election of Trump has been good for climate change because it stops the rest of the world waiting around for America to solve the problem, right? So if the Germans and the Chinese now get together and do technology, green tech, bring it to scale, China, for example, has installed more solar in the past two years than the United States has, right? If they end up doing that, we're the suckers because we should have been leading the investment. We'll be buying it from them. But in a way, if that forces them to do that and that's good in a global sense, go for it. So does that mean Trump was a good leader in that regard? Well, that's a different question, right? <laughs> but it can have a positive effect. So the macro, like, let's not sum it all up to, you know, the one leader, the genius, the charisma, whatever, that does everything. That's not a good way of thinking about it. They can make a difference. But the key thing is when they've actually got the trust of everybody who's, who wants them to lead, that's when societies work better. But when you have leaders who are divisive, who pit people against each other, that never works out for anybody. That's the type of populism you want to avoid. All right, ladies and gentlemen, two things. First, I'd like to remind you to mark your calendars for the next Ian Thompson Forum. It will feature the British National Debate Team as they tackle the question, is regulation of social media necessary to protect democracy? It's November 11th at 7 p.m. here at the Lead Center. Secondly, join me in thanking Dr. Mark Blythe. Thank you all for coming. Oh, shush, shush.